May I invite you this morning to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and uh, verse 28. Luke chapter 19 and verse 28 reads as follows. When he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethanich and to Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a coat tied on which no one has ever set. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus shall you say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the coat, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the coat? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus and, and, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. The Lord has need of you. Today is Palm Sunday. Also known as this, this day as the start of Holy Week. Holy Week begins with a parade or a processional into Jerusalem. When you read the various gospel writers, it's amazing how much material that they have devoted to this last week in the life of our Lord. Matthew's gospel, he devotes one-fourth of his gospel to the events of the last week of the life of our Lord. Mark devotes one-third of his writing material to this final week in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke devotes one-fifth. And John devotes half of what he has written in John's Gospel is devoted to this last week in the life of our Lord. This week, is the most important week in all of human history. We who have been in Los Angeles this past week, we have seen a parade. We have witnessed a processional like none other. It indeed has been the very talk of the town. But this parade was given in honor of someone who has been. About 2,000 years ago, there was a parade that was also the talk of the town. But that parade was given for someone who is Lord, someone who is, reigns over the universe. In that hour, they were recognizing and saluting the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Lord of glory, He's coming, riding into Jerusalem in a very humble, a very lowly way. The Lord of glory is going to make his royal entry. This journey to Jerusalem really began about nine months ago in the days of our Lord. It started in Galilee, and our Lord was going to make his way down to Jerusalem. He was going to pass through Samaria, Perea. He was going to go through Judea. 
he was going to make at least 35 stops on his way to Jerusalem. He would be teaching, he would be healing, he would be performing various miracles. But the goal of his journey was to get to Jerusalem because it was in Jerusalem where he would offer up his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. When you read verse 1 of, when you read chapter 19 and verse 28, it says that our Lord went on before his disciples as they made their way to the city of Jerusalem. And immediately when I saw that he went on before them, I began to reflect as I read the scriptures, that's always the way of the Lord. He is a God who goes on before. Our Lord never plays catch up in my life or in your life. He knows where we are going and he is already there. He knows what you are going to experience next week, next month, next year. And you will find that the Lord, as you walk with him, is a God who goes before his people. Very recently, you have noticed that I am driving a vehicle that is an old vehicle, but it's new to me. And it was very interesting to me that as I drive my new old vehicle, it's a vehicle that has needed several repairs. And um, I'm not so in tune with where to get repair work done except to take it to the dealer. And if you take it to the dealer, you know the dealer tends to be the most expensive place in town. But in the way that God goes before you in my morning trip to McDonald's, I was introduced to a gentleman there and uh, this gentleman, by the name of McGee, is a person who at one time was a mechanic. And not only was he a mechanic at one time, but he did some work on cars. And so he knows where to get work done well and where to get it done inexpensively. So as I began to reflect on that, I said, isn't that just like God? God knew that I was going to buy an old new car. That old new car was going to need some work done on it. That I did not have a, a clue as to really where to go to get the repairs done that needed to be done. But God just kind of opened up and brought somebody into my life that when our paths crossed, I needed his service and God had already placed him there because that's just the way God does things. God has a way of going before his people. And when you get there at the various junctions of your life, God is there and he opens the door. He makes the way because he is an all-knowing, all-wise, all-sufficient, everlasting and eternal God. Our pathway is unknown to us, but God knows the pathway that we're going to take. And so God knows how to strategically place people in your life. God knows how to strategically set up circumstances into your life so that when you get there, the doors begin to open. Or if need be, when you get there, the doors close. All I want to know is that I serve a God who goes on before me. A God who's not surprised about where my life is leading and going and where I, what the pathway of life has for me, but a God who is there, and because he's there, he's able to order my steps just so that I have what I need when I get to where I'm supposed to be. Jesus went before his disciples. Now, the key word there and the operative word there may very well be his disciples. So, if I am a disciple, if I am a follower, 
If my hand is in the hand of the Lord, I can depend on God to direct my way. I can depend on God to lead me in his perfect way. Not only does he say to his disciples, does he go before them, but he knows that uh, he's going to need some, something to ride on as he goes into Jerusalem, as he makes his entry. So he sends two disciples ahead of him. He tells them to go into the village and there they will find a young donkey, one that has never been ridden on. Now it might seem to our eyes that all of this is just sort of happening out of happenstance and casually puts to, being put together, but I'm here to say to you that this has been preordained by the hand of Almighty God. It was prophesied in the Old Testament by the prophet Zechariah that the Messiah would come and he would come riding on a young donkey. This is all a confirmation that this Jesus, this one who has been walking and teaching and preaching and ministering, that he is indeed the Messiah, that he is the one that all of Israel has been looking for, that he comes in the lineage of David, the great king of the nation Israel. He comes in riding on a donkey. Not a war horse, not a stallion, prancing and snorting and foaming at the mouth, but he is very intentional that he comes lowly. He comes humbly. He comes gently. And this is the way that the Word of God reveals the Savior. It is said of him in the Old Testament, he said, Israel, I will draw you with cords and bands of love. Now, when we come, we want people to know who we are. We want to come in and throw our weight around and we want to come in and be rough and tough and we want to come in and we want to come as it were in our power and in our might. But when the Lord Jesus comes, he comes gently, he comes humbly, he comes lowly. Do you know that Jesus will never force his way into your life? He will come and he will knock at the, your heart's door, but he's not going to come and knock the door down. You've got to open the door. You've got to have an openness, a receptivity to the word and to the spirit of the Lord because he's not going to take a sledgehammer and open the door of your life. He doesn't come with arrogance and pride but he comes humbly, he comes gently, he comes riding on a donkey. Not only does he come riding on the donkey, but he comes riding on a donkey that has never been ridden on before. He comes riding on the colt, a very young donkey. He tells the disciples, he says, when you go there into Jerusalem, you're going into Bethany rather, when you go to Bethany, you're going to find this donkey tied up. And I want you to untie him and bring him to me. And if someone asks you why you are untying him, simply tell them that the Lord hath need of him. Untie him and bring him to me because the Lord hath need of him. You've got to untie him, and after you untie him, then you bring him to me because I have need of him. I wonder if there's anyone here today that needs to be untied. You are bound. You are tied up as it were. The Lord hath need of you, 
But before the Lord can use you, he's got to have you untied. You are so tied up and tangled up in the affairs and in this life and in this world that you are very little used to the Lord Jesus Christ. And before he can use you, you need to be untied. Sometimes we're tied up by bitterness and jealousy and envy and pride. Sometimes we're tied up by hatred and a lack of forgiveness. Sometimes we're tied up with our lust and our passions and our desires and our possessions. Sometimes the Lord would like to use us, but we're tied to comfort. We are tied to conveniences. We are tied to our stuff. And we're offline, as it were. Because we are tied up. Attitudes. Actions. You see, there are times, there are some people who are so tied up by being upstairs that they can't get used to being downstairs. Now, the Lord is the same everywhere. The Lord, the Lord is God everywhere, wherever you gather together. It's not the building that makes the church, it is the people that makes the church. But we get tied up, and we get tied down. And we get tied to our traditions and to our ways and to our methodologies. We get tied. And when we are tied up, we are restricted, as it were, and restrained. And the Spirit of God is unable to have free course in our lives in the way that he would like to. We need to be loosed and let go. And do you know there's no one who can untie you like Jesus? It matters not how bound I am. It matters not how tied up I may be this morning. I may have a drug habit. I may have a, a, a pornography addiction. I may be bound by lust or pride or whatever, but no one can untie me. No one can loose me like Jesus can loose me. If I am willing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him as my Savior and follow him as the Lord of my life, he can loose me and set me free so that I can serve him and live to the honor and glory of his name. Jesus told those disciples, he says there's a, a donkey there. Matter of fact, it's not the uh, parent donkey, it's the, the colt, it, it's the child, or not the child, but uh, it's the young donkey. And uh, it's amazing at times how the people will say that, well, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm just, a, in so many words, they're saying, you know, what can God do with me? They, they, in so many words, they're saying, you know, I'm just the old donkey. What can God do with me? Uh, I, I don't have this gift. I don't have that gift. I don't have that talent. I can't sing. I can't preach. I can't pray. I can't do this. But it, it's, it's amazing what, what can happen when you're in the hand of the Lord. It is indeed uh, amazing that when I am loosed and let go and I am brought to the Lord of glory. It, it's no telling how he may want to use me. This uh, donkey would have been like any other donkey except this donkey is being talked to about 2,000 years later because the king of glory chose to sit on this donkey. Our lives in the hand of God. It's amazing the potential of my life and your life in the hand of God. They, they bring the, that, uh, uh, they, they, they say that to tell them that 
loose him and let him go, and they're going to ask the question, well, why are you loosing him? And he said, just simply tell them that the Lord hath need of him. Oh, I, I, I really need to pause there for a moment. Because I, I don't believe there is, there's not one individual here this morning. I don't think there is one person who's here by accident or happenstance. But I believe that you are here today because it has been ordained in the councils of eternity that God would have you here because God would like to plant this seed into your heart that the Lord hath need of you. There's something that God wants you to do. There is a place that God wants to send you. There is somebody's life that God wants you to touch. You, well, you say, well, Reverend, isn't that your job to go and win? No, I can't go everywhere. And I can't be all things to all people. But that's the reason that God has a multitude of people. And as he lays his hand on us one and all, there are unique and specific assignments that Almighty God has for us. The Lord, he said, tell them that the Lord hath need of him. What is it that you have this morning that the Lord hath need of? I believe that there is some time that you have that God very well may have need of. That there are resources in terms of talent that God has need of. There is treasure, there are, there are finances that God has blessed you with that God hath need of. There, are, there is energy, there is praise that God hath need of. There is a companionship that God hath need of. God wants to have an intimate relationship with you. Tell them that the Lord hath need of him. The Bible says that the disciples, they went on into the city, they found the colt exactly as, our, as the Bible, as God had revealed it, as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they came into the city, found the colt, identified the colt, began to go to the colt, began to untie the colt, to take the colt back to Jesus. Someone asked him, ask them, what in the world are you doing? And uh, they simply said, the Lord hath need of him. And when they told them that the Lord hath need of him, the owner stepped back did not question the transaction at all and released that donkey immediately because the Lord hath need of him. Can God step on to the landscape of my life and yours and say, I have a need? And are you willing to bring it and surrender it to Jesus as they surrender that cult quickly and obediently, they didn't hold on to it by saying, oh no, that's mine. What, what are you doing? Oh no, what are you doing? Are you crazy? And sometimes when the Lord says to us, uh, I have need of this time. I have need of this treasure. I have need of this talent. I have need of this praise. Immediately, many times, we step back and say, oh, no, that, not, not that. That's special to me. I want to hold on to that. I can't let go of that. Well, you know, I have need of that. You know that relationship? I have need of that. God knows where we are, how we are, and am I willing to say, yes, Lord. When he says, I have need of whatever he identifies in your life or in my life, am I willing to release it? Am I willing to surrender it? The disciples take it. They bring it to Jesus, and the rest, as they say, it's history. 
They bring the colt, they bring it to Jesus. They begin to lay their cloaks on his back. They begin to make, as it were, kind of a saddle. They place the king of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ, on this uh, pad that they have created on the back of this colt. And then they begin to walk down the road toward Jerusalem. And as they begin to draw near to Jerusalem, they are beginning to give our Lord the red carpet treatment, as it were. They are a group coming, and they are joined by others who begin to stream forth from the city the news begins to spread through the city that he is coming and they begin to rejoice and praise the name of God they lift up their voice and they say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and they praise and they rejoice in the Savior who is on his way into the city of Jerusalem the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they watched this processional. And I'm sure there were some people who watched the processional this week. Probably some in this very room. And said, <laughs> and said, is all this necessary? <laughs> I'm listening to Janice up here saying, uh, no, that wasn't all that wasn't necessary. This is exactly what the Pharisees and scribes said. All of this is not necessary. And they said to Jesus the Christ, they said, Master, tell your disciples, rebuke them. Tell them to stop because they are going overboard. They are simply out of control. Who is this unknown, this teacher? And why does he merit all of this adoration and adulation and praise why? But all oh, they didn't know that he was king of kings, that he was lord of lords. And he said to them, he says, well, if I stop them from crying out, if I stop them from recognizing and giving the praise that the king of glory deserves, he said the very rocks would cry out and they would begin to praise the name of the Lord. Do you not realize, brothers and sisters, that the Word of God says that all of creation groans, that the very nature itself groans because it wants to ascribe unto the Lord Jesus the glory that is due His name. And so when we sit on our praise, He's still worthy of His praise. And there is going to be a day when the creation is going to recognize that he is Lord. Yes, today's a, a very good day to recognize that whatever binds you, he can set you free. Whatever binds. And sometimes some of us have been bound a very long time. We've, we've, we've been kind of going around in the same circle day after day, month after month, year after year, being bound by the same habits, the same attitudes, being bound by the same desires, the same lusts, the same passions, being bound by our this addiction or that addiction. But I'm here to say to you and remind you this morning that there is no other name like the name of Jesus. For that is the highest name in heaven and the highest name on earth. And there is salvation, there is deliverance in the name of Jesus. He can set us free from our sin, from our selfishness. He can set us free from ourselves because the Lord hath need of us. He wants a relationship with us. He has given to us gifts and talents and he wants us to use them to the glory, to the honor, to the praise of his great name. For there is no other name like the name of Jesus. There's going to be a, another parade one day. The Bible says that in that parade, every knee shall bow. 
and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our founder, Charles Price Jones, said of that day, he said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. Tis the coming of the King. Lift up your heads, ye pilgrims. There's a message from the sky. List how the saints are shouting and the very heavens ring. Tis the hour of your redemption and the King is nigh. Lo, he comes, coming to earth again. Shout ye ransom at the coming of the King. He came 2,000 years ago. He rode into Jerusalem in his glory. It was his triumphal entry. He's going to come again in triumph. He's going to come again in his glory. There's going to be an hour, there's going to be a day in the not too distant future where once again our Lord is going to come. And will you be one? Will you be ready? Will you be prepared to meet him? The Lord hath need of you this morning. And you know where he's knocking in your life. You know what he wants you to bring and lay at his feet and surrender to him.